Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming out today for Coffee and Viz. And we were impressed with the overwhelming interest in this program. So thanks to everyone who decided to stay home or in their office and watch on Zoom. Hi, uh, my name's Hannah Rainey and I'm the Associate Head for the Research Engagement Department here at the Libraries. So thank you so much for coming out. This Coffee and Viz series provides a forum for researchers at NC State and others to share their work as it relates to visualization research and practice, the use of visualization tools, or the unique presentation and design of data visualization. We hope that these programs provide a catalyst for collaboration and the promotion of visualization best practices across campus and our wider community. And before I introduce our speaker, I wanna highlight that the libraries has a wellness and accessibility tech lending collection. Um, and as this talk is about color, uh, I've checked out a few pairs of the Enchroma Ellis indoor colorblind glasses that can be checked out by students, staff, and faculty. So if anyone should need those or are interested in what service they provide, I, they're actually back um, near those monitors. So you can test them out after the talk, or if you'd like it, I can bring a pair to you while the talk is happening. So without further ado, I am very happy to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Christopher Healy. Dr. Healy is a Goodnight Distinguished Professor of Analytics at the Institute for Advanced Analytics, as well as a professor in the Department of Computer Science here at NC State University. His research interests include visualization, graphics, visual perception, and areas of applied mathematics, machine learning, natural language processing, and aesthetics related to visual analysis and data management. And each term, Dr. Healy brings a cohort from the advanced from the Institute of Advanced Analytics into this place, this space, excuse me, to explore how color works. And some of you may also recall that Dr. Healy delivered this talk in 2015 as one of our first Coffee and Viz presenters ever. So we're so excited to have him back um, to give this presentation to you all as the space has been renovated since then. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Christopher Healy. Thanks, Hannah. And thanks for inviting me out again. I guess I didn't get banned the first time here. All right. And thank you all for coming. Yep. And so if you haven't seen it, the room has been renovated since the last time I was here. I think probably about six months you've had it up and running. And so we've um, reformatted the slides for the new space, which is just excellent. And so for anyone who's interested in this kind of presentation, I really encourage you to consider putting something together. The library makes it very easy to do and very easy to use the space. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a quick introduction to color. Um, it's impossible to talk about all of it. Uh, and maybe I'll give you a little flavor of, of the different bits and pieces and why it's such a big topic. Okay. And so, of course, I present this to my students and I always tell them at the beginning, uh, Sic Parvis Magna, which some of you may know is Sir Francis Drake's, um, great things from small beginnings. Yeah. So what is color? Well, color is something that everybody knows something about and I don't think anyone knows everything about. Um, and so I'm going to go through some of the physical, perceptual, and visualization aspects of color, just to try to give you a little flavor of how it works and what we do with it. So when people first looked at color, they actually thought it was some sort of combination of light and dark that somehow produced the colors that we see in the world around us. And Sir Francis Drake, or sorry, uh, Sir Isaac Newton initially said, no, I don't think that's true. I think that color is actually a combination of a very small number of primary colors that are mixing together in a way that produces all the colors that we see in the world around us. And in fact, that's true. And his color wheel, Newton's color wheel, is very similar to the color wheels that we use in a lot of the color models that we look at nowadays. Um, next, uh, Thomas Young. Thomas Young 
hypothesize that the way color moves around us or through the world around us is this a set of waves that are propagating color? And that was also correct. And so his wave theory, uh, in fact, corresponds to how color works. It's a very small slice of the uh, color uh, spectrum, which is called the visible color spectrum. And I'll show you how that works uh, a little later on. And then we have uh, um, Maxwell Clark, who is a Scottish researcher. And so he actually thought the color was just a very small number of primaries. And he actually chose red, green, and blue, interestingly. And so he put color filters over top of a Scottish tartan and photographed or recreated each one of these and then combined them together to produce this final result. And so most people consider this the first photograph that was ever produced. That was back in the uh, mid 1800s. So, so nowadays we have more sophisticated color models like the ones you can see up here. Uh, these are from the CIE, which is the Commission Internationale de la Clarge in France, which is responsible for, um, I guess, standardizing many of these color models. And so right here is CIE XYZ. Uh, this is a base color model that we use and it's capable of representing all the colors that we can see in the visible color spectrum. Uh, the one in the middle is CIE L star, A star, B star. And it's actually a nonlinear transformation of this color model. And its specific purpose is such that if you take a relatively small distance in this color scale and look at the perceived difference between the colors, uh, the same distance in some other part of this color scale should produce the same perceived difference. And so it's what's called a perceptually balanced color model. Okay. And then on the right, we're actually looking at a slice through X, Y, Z. This is called the CIE block body, block, black body path. Uh, and we'll actually look at this later, but this is how color scales are built, is that we take one of these color models and we actually plot a path through them and look at the colors along the path. Okay. So what's color used for? Um, so here are two examples. Uh, for those of you who are marine biologists, you'll probably recognize the 4L ULA scale. And so the way this works for people who haven't seen this is that you take that disc on the upper right, it's called a sochi disc. And so you stick it in the water and you descend it until you can just no longer make out the white parts of the disc. And then you raise it exactly one half the distance. You sent it down and you look at the color of the white disc and you try to match it up to one of the color samples in your uh, 4L ULA sample box. And that's supposed to tell you something about the water composition, uh, both the sedimentary and the biological composition. And so that's an example of using color to try to figure out some property of the water that you're actually studying. Uh, on the right is something called a spot photometer. And so these used to be really expensive. I assume they're cheaper now, but the way they work is that they're like a laser spotter. So you point it at something and you shoot out a beam and it measures the color at the point that you're pointing at and it actually reports it back in XYZ coordinates. And so it's a way to very accurately measure the color of something. Um, there's a funny story about the time that I used one of this guy that I worked with when I was a PhD student, but I'm gonna tell you the dog story about him. This is funnier. So over on the right, you can also see um, color can be used for aesthetics. And so here we're looking at three paintings from Monet uh, near the end of his life after he had retreated to his cottage in Giverny. And they actually go in time sequence uh, from left, it's about 1899. I think the one on the right is around 1920. And you might notice that they look maybe a little more abstract as you move from left to right. And so Monet had uh, glaucoma at the end of his life. And so he was losing his vision. And so true to his impressionist nature, he's actually painting his impression of what he sees as his vision fails. And so that's why the paintings look the way they do. Yeah. So. In the center, a lot of people often wonder if they're not colorblind, what do colorblind people see? And so 
Uh, the colored pencils in the center are uh, for normally sighted people, uh, ranging in different colors. If you were red, green colorblind, uh, which is the most common type of colorblindness, you're probably going to see that the pencils in the center look somewhat similar or similar to one of the four examples on the left. Okay, and so red, green colorblind affects, it depends on how you measure it, but it would be anywhere from about 10 to 17% of male population. Uh, males, because it's an X chromosome deficit, and so females have two X chromosomes, males have one. And you should know if you're red, green, colorblind, because when you take your driver's exam, they test you for this. Okay, when they show you the dots and ask you to tell you what number you're looking at, if you can't tell them, you're colorblind. Okay. Uh, these are some other kinds of colorblindness on the right. And so these are less common. So it's possible that you could have a problem in the blue region, um, or you could be completely uh, monochromatic, monochromacy, where your uh, visual system is not capable of presenting any color information. And so if you saw something like this, you would be like a cat, except your vision wouldn't be as good as a cat because they're luminance detection properties are much better than ours, okay? And these are two examples of where we'd be using color for visualization. And it looks like this is on a county level or maybe even at a higher level of detail. Um, but these are very common examples of things that you would see where we're showing temperature. And so average temperatures in January, average temperatures in July. And I think the thing that you should take away from this is that there's a context here, right? Everybody has, a, at least in the Western um, sort of world, everybody has a certain expectation about reds being hot and blues being cold. And so you'll see that you have to take that into account in addition to the actual strengths and limitations of color when you're building visualizations. So you can build a great visualization, but if it completely violates the context that people expect, it's not good because it's just gonna confuse them, right? If reds are cold on a color temperature map, even if you tell them that, it's gonna be hard for them to understand what they're looking at, okay? So vision sort of splits up into two parts, physical and perceptual. The physical part we understand pretty well. So this is a cutaway of the back of your retina. Uh, you have rods and cones. You have about 120 million rods and 6 million cones, give or take. And so um, the cones come in three different types. And the types respond most strongly to three different wavelengths of light. And so those particular wavelengths come out of the visible color spectrum. And so, as I said, this is the set of um, different types of wavelengths of light that you can get. And you can see that the visible color spectrum is a very thin slice. It runs from about 400 nanometers up to about 700 nanometers. Uh, below that, you have UV, X-ray, and gamma ray. And then above that, you'd have infrared, microwave, uh, radio wave, and then long radio wave, which would be how you communicate with things like submarines under the water. Okay. And so your rods are responsible for detecting variations, actually variations in the three wavelengths of light, um, low, medium, and high. And so people often call these red, green, and blue cones. And the reason they do is because those particular areas of the visible color spectrum correspond roughly to red, green, and blue, okay? And people think that cones do color and rods do luminance. That's not entirely true, actually. In regular light or bright light, cones do everything, luminance and color, and the rods don't do anything, okay? But once light falls below a certain level, the cones don't work anymore. They don't respond anymore, and then the rods take over but the rods can only detect luminance. They can't detect differences in the wavelength of light. They can't detect differences in color. They're just measuring energy, okay? And so um, that's why when things get darker, you can actually tell differences in brightness, but not differences in color. So if I went to my closet and the lights were off and I opened it up, I could tell whether the shirts that I have hanging there are lighter shirts or darker shirts, but I can't tell, for example, is that light blue? Is that is that yellow? Is that light green? No way of knowing, okay. 
Um, these are how you actually plot color out. And so this is actually uh, plotting energy across different wavelengths of light. And it's from a um, telescope. And so telescopes are capable of actually measuring energy outside of the visible color spectrum. And so this dark blue region is where we would be able to see something. And then above and below that is ultraviolet infrared. Okay, and so all telescopes can see outside of that because the astronomers need that information uh, to do what they do. All right. This is just an example that came actually quite a while ago, I think, from Apple, uh, basically comparing um, the amount of energy across the visible spectrum for two different iPads. And I think the point they were trying to make here is that their new iPad is brighter uh, than the previous one. Right. So. Um, this is Albert Munsell's color model, it came in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And so his interest was in trying to build a color model that worked like an artist's palette. And so if you do paint, you understand that you usually start out with a base color and then you add something to it and you mix it up until you get what you want. And so his model has three dimensions or three axes. Uh, the one that I'm not really showing here is one that goes straight up through the pole and that's the luminance axis. So things are dark on the bottom and bright on the top or white on the top. And then around the circumference is what's called hue. And that would be the way that you name something. And so he has 10 primary hues and it's red, red, purple, 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 blue, 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 green, and so on, yellow, yellow, red. And then as you radiate out from the center, that's saturation. Saturation is considered to be sort of the purity of the color. So if you think about an NC state red, that would be a fairly pure red. And then pink is an unsaturated red. And you can think of it as taking a pure color and adding white to it. The more white you add, the less saturation it has until you finally get down to some shade of gray, which is fully unsaturated. Okay. This is another color model called Pantone. Anyone who does graphic design would recognize this. And so if you do graphic design, one of the main problems you have, in fact, even if you don't, is that when you design something on the monitor and then you print it on the printer, it never looks the same, right? And that's because the gamuts of the two uh, devices are different and they're actually calibrated differently. So what Pantone does is you can buy Pantone compatible monitors and Pantone compatible printers. And so in a package like Photoshop, you can actually specify colors using Pantone numbers. And because you're using pre-calibrated monitors and printers, it guarantees that what you see on the monitor is exactly what you're gonna get when you print it on the printer, which is critical for anyone who's doing graphic design or any other type of job where it's really important that what you see on the monitor is what you get when you print the result on the printer. Okay. So there's lots of different ways of representing color and uh, each has its own advantages and disadvantages. But if I ask you, so what's the most common way of representing color? Um, I don't know, does anyone have any suggestions? Like if, if you asked your mother, like what color tie am I wearing? Would you say it's uh, green 32, blue 67, red 212? Probably not, right? Yeah, she'd say it's red. So that's color naming. And so color naming is by far the most popular way for people to represent color, unless you're some sort of weirdo color scientist like I am, right? And so the disadvantage of color naming is it's very ambiguous. And so if you were a student in my class and I told you, hey, I want you to go to the monitor and I want you to uh, put a blue square up there and I'm gonna grade you on, on whether it's the blue square I want or not that would concern you, right? Because you would think, well, what, what do you mean by blue? Like light blue, dark blue, medium blue, like turquoise, cornflower blue. That's actually, it's always cornflower blue, by the way, but anyway. So ambiguous, right? Language is ambiguous. And so language for color is ambiguous, all right? Um, but there is an area where language is used all the time, actually a number of areas for a particular reason, and so this is one example. Um, if you go to any home hardware store, big box store, um, place that sells paint, you'll see these. These are paint swatches. 
And for any given particular brand, uh, like Bear or Sherwin Williams or Glidden or whatever, they'll have um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these, uh, each with five, six, seven different examples. So thousands of different colors. And every color has a name. So things like sunny or arboretum or elf green or tickled pink or pink stork. This one's pink pink, I think. I can't quite see it, but I'm pretty sure it's pink pink. Um, so what's interesting to me about this is that although those wouldn't necessarily be the names that I might pick, I very rarely see a name that I think is inappropriate for the particular color. And naming colors is really hard. You might think, oh, this is easy. It's not easy, all right? So I had a friend who worked at a company called Silicon Graphics, uh, doesn't exist anymore. Um, but she said that at some point they had to pick a whole bunch of names for greens. I don't know why. So they started out, all right, let's go. Green, light green, medium green, dark green, grass green, verdant green. And so they didn't get very far and they started to slow down. And then she said, at some point, someone said, what about garbage bag green? And then at that point they were like, okay, we're done. We're not doing this anymore because they realized that they weren't going to be able to get the greens that they wanted. So, you know, there's a few jobs I want, not including the one I have. One is making new chocolate bars, because that never happens. Um, and the other is, I don't know who gets this job, but I want this job, okay? And so why do they do this? Well, I always ask, why would you pick a color of pink stork for your room? Somebody's having a baby, right? And they want the room to be colored in pink stork. These names are meant to evoke emotion. They're meant to evoke emotion to encourage you or motivate you to buy a particular color. And in that context, names are exactly the right thing to use, right? Same thing happens with clothing. And I only show women's clothing here because they tend to be much more expressive in their naming than men's clothing, which is generally like white, black, blue, let's see, yellow maybe, I don't know. It's actually getting better, but yeah. So gunmetal, fuchsia, Neptune, it's uh, blue, gray, pink, and dark blue, right? But they don't use those names. They use these other names, again, because they're trying to encourage you or invoke a certain emotion in you that motivates you for purchase. Okay. So where do these names come from? Well, there was some very interesting work done at uh, UC Berkeley back in the mid 60s by Berlin and Kay. And so they were curious about what are the basic names that different linguistic cultures use within that language, okay? And so when I say basic names, what I mean is if I ask you to name something and you say, oh, that's uh, persimmon or that's um, you know pistachio, I'm like, oh, so you mean green. Okay, it's green. All right, so they sampled a little over 150 different linguistic cultures, which is actually a lot. Um, so if you wonder how many would you get if you did that? So they got a tribe in the Amazon that generally doesn't interact with uh, people outside of their tribe. Inuit were in there. Um, so pretty much a good range of cultures. And a very interesting thing happened. Uh, not every culture uh, uses the same basic colors, but there are 11 total. And if you tell me how many a culture uses, I can tell you what they are. Well, I can. Berlin and K can. And because I know what they did, I can tell you too. So it everyone has black and white. All right. And if you have a third basic color, it's going to be red. If you have a fourth, it's either going to be green or yellow. And then the fifth would be the other one. The sixth is blue, the seventh is brown, and then eight, nine, 10, and 11 would be some combination of purple, pink, orange, and gray, okay? So English is the language that has all 11, all right? 
uh, other languages don't. Um, the only other languages that I know, French and, and uh, Japanese, it's, so certainly orange is not a base color in Japanese. I mean, they know what it is. They have a word for it now, uh, which is just a Japanized version of the English language orange, is orange, right? So somebody obviously heard this and they thought, okay, well, we need to figure out how to make a word for this. So they made it up, all right? Uh, pink is momo, which is peach, actually. So I don't know how that works out. Um, so, of course, you can imagine this caused enormous controversy in the uh, psychological field where they worked on this. And many, many people work to disprove this because that's how things work in psychology. Um, but I read a number of papers. Nobody really disproved it. And so I guess Berlin and Kay got tired of this at some point. So about 15 years later, they went on and did another mm, 50 cultures and got exactly the same results. And so to my knowledge, nobody's shown that this isn't true, uh, which is weird to me, because I would never guess that this is true, but I'll take their word for it. So, yep. If, if Japanese doesn't have a word for orange, what is the name of the country that called color of Tori? Of Tori? Tori. Hmm. I don't know actually what they had before orange. Now they call it orange. Yeah, but they obviously didn't have that word. In fact, they didn't have that word in English either. Uh, I was always curious, like what came first, orange the color or orange the fruit? And so, yeah, the color actually came first, according to what I read. So, yeah, so, so I could certainly look this up and try to figure out. So what did, how did they describe this when they actually didn't have this color? Um, I don't know. There's other weird things about Japanese too. So they flip blue and green from what we use, right? So the lights in the stoplight isn't green, it's blue. Yeah, and uh, spring uh, leaves are blue, they're not green. So that's just the culture and how they describe things. And so I have no idea. So this is a completely different issue of like, is what I see and call blue what you see and call blue? Or do I see something completely different, but I was just taught to call that blue for my whole life? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's not true, but I can't know for sure. So think about it. Yeah. You could probably get a thesis on this. I know someone who got a thesis on Pacheco, so you can get a thesis on anything. Um, this is a more traditional sort of computer graphics type representation of color. And so it has three axes, red, green, and blue. And so there, this is the RGB color cube. And so what you do is you get the primaries of the eight corners. So you get black, you get white, uh, red, green, blue, and then cyan, magenta, and yellow, okay? Depending on whether you have zero or one, nothing or all of these colors. And then of course you get different variations of shades across the face. And there's plenty of colors in the center too that we can't see, right? So if you wonder, where did this come from? Well, all monitors, uh, even the new monitors that are coming out are actually made up of um, pictures, pixel elements, uh, pixels, picture elements that are uh, a triad of a red, green, and blue dot. And they're small enough so that when you see them from a reasonable distance, uh, they fuse into a combination of that color. Okay. If you jam your eye right up on there, you can see the individual pixel. You can do it, it won't hurt you. So, and you might wonder, well, why did the monitor manufacturers build these red, green, blue triads? Because uh, they were trying to mimic human vision, right? And they knew there were red, green, blue cones. And so they thought that would be good. And so as computer graphics people, uh, the most obvious way for us to control color in a monitor was just to have three knobs to twiddle that would vary the amount of red, green, and blue that the monitor was producing, since that's the set of base colors that it's producing. So from that perspective, it makes sense. Uh, the problem is that it's not an intuitive model, okay? So if I asked you to tell me how much, like what triple to give me for red or green and blue or something like that, that's easy. What about orange? What's the triple for orange? Yeah, I don't know either. I would go to a color picker, I would pick the orange I wanted, and I would read off the RGB, All right? So not intuitive. Yeah. 
This is another model, HSV or HLS, sort of depends on, on how you're describing it. We'll say HSV, Hue saturation value. And so um, very much like Munsell, there's a luminance. The L pole goes up from the center, dark at the bottom, and you see a white spot at the top. Saturation radi radiates out from the center, and then uh, Hue is around the outside. So HS, HLS or HSV, okay? The interesting thing about this is that if I take this, uh, this cube, and you can't see it, but the black corner's on the back side there. If I tip it up on its, um, yeah, tip it up on its black edge, so the black is at the bottom and the white is at the top, and I push down. I get this. So this is a linear combination of this. Right. These are both what are called emissive color models, so they emit light uh, through a television, through some other type of device, and then your eye uh, receives that light and combines it to produce colors. Um, this CMI or CMYK is a subtractive model. These are additive, this is subtractive, and this is what you use in printers. And so the way a printer works is that you take a white piece of paper and it puts a die down on it. And what the die does is it actually blocks some of the incoming light. So what reflects back out has a chunk taken out of it. Okay. So if you look at magenta, uh, you can see that what it's doing is it's actually removing green and leaving only red and uh, blue to reflect back. So that's why you see purple, right? Because red plus blue is purple. And similarly, uh, cyan is removing red and yellow is removing blue. And the way this works in a printer is that actually um, there an element is a bunch of tiny little dots. And by varying the number and pattern of the dots, you can vary the intensity of the color or how much light you're gonna block, okay? And K is black. And in theory, if you put red uh, plus green plus blue, or, fil or C plus N plus Y filters down, you would be blocking all of the red and green and blue and you would get black, but it never perfectly works. So you get a sort of muddy looking black. And so most printer manufacturers should be giving you a separate tank for black, first, so that you get pure black. But second, because the majority of what you print is black. And so you'd be really cheap if you gave them a CMY K tank and then every time black ran out, you have to throw it out, but most of your cyan magenta yellow wouldn't be used up. All right. So, yeah. And if you're curious about this and you don't believe me, and you know, that's good. Uh, <laughs> print on a piece of paper that's not white. Okay. So if you think about a blue piece of paper, well, that's already removed because it's blue. Some of the reflected light that's supposed to be white. So when you print on there, it's not gonna work because the assumption is that you start with white and remove from that, not that you start with blue and you remove from that. And so you'll get some weird looking results. So a simple monitor. I like this monitor specifically because it's from Samsung, but it has an Apple UI on it, which is interesting. I don't know why that is, uh, yeah. Um, if you wonder about these, I just sort of put this up as an aside, but um, the initial flat screens like this, um, LCD, L LCD monitors, uh, just like with the CRT monitors, they have the same kind of triads, they're red, green, blue dots that are actually filtering uh, what's called a backlight. So in these monitors, uh, traditionally, there's always a light that's being reflected off a reflective part of the back of the screen and coming out. And what the triads are doing is they're actually blocking some of that light from getting to you, okay? So it's sort of like the TV's always on and they're trying to block it. And you can tell this because if you think about it, when you turn your TV on, you notice the first thing that happens is it sort of brightens up even though it's black, that's the backlight turning on. And it's also telling you, oh, even when you fully filter the light, you can't pluck it all out. Right, it's just like CMY. Like you don't get a perfect black, you get a muddy black. You don't get a perfect black here because the um, LCD filters can't fully block the light. 
So some of the new technologies are trying to solve that. And the two that you're probably most familiar, familiar with are one would be, they have all sorts of different uh, names for them like QLED or micro dots or local dimming. But basically what happens there is rather than having a single fluorescent tube or tubes around the edges that are creating this light bouncing off, they have a separate layer behind the filters that have little uh, LED lights on them. Usually there's about a three by three or four by four patch of pixels and there's one LED light behind it. And then if that patch of pixels is supposed to be black, you can just turn the light off. And when you turn the light off, you get pure black. Okay. So those local dimming type monitors, which are becoming more popular, give much better contrast and much better color fidelity. And then there's uh, OLED, organic light emitting diodes. Uh, those don't use backlights because the individual elements themselves emit light when they're uh, energized through an electric grid. And so they're self-illuminating. And so every element can be turned on or off by however much you want. And so they'll give you even better uh, results and perfect blacks in all the regions that are supposed to be black. Uh, the main difference is that OLEDs can't um, usually shine as bright as an LCD. And so you're trading off some color fidelity for brightness. And there's a bunch of new technologies coming along. We'll see whether they uh, make their way to commercial result or not. So this is that slice through the XYZ space again. And so you remember that I told you that uh, monitors use three triads, red, green, and blue. And you can actually plot the location of these on this particular um, slice. And the way this model works is that for any solid like this, you can get anything along the edges or anything on the inside by some combination of the three vertices. Okay. And so a consequence of this is if I plot the location of the three triads, can I ever cover this entire solid? Well, no, right? No triangle can cover this horseshoe. So the consequence of that is that, although most people don't think about it this way, uh, no monitor can ever display every color we can actually see in the real world. Right? And usually it's up in the green region where you're missing a bit. And it's not much. Um, this makes it look very bad, but it's nowhere near this bad. But if I was being mean, I would sit you in front of a monitor. I would go outside and I would find something that I knew you couldn't build and I'd bring it back in and I'd say produce the screen for me on the monitor and you wouldn't be able to yeah because the monitor can't do it and I'm trolling you right yeah. so they had monitors for a while that had four trads uh there was an extra one down in the yellow area these were the um quattros from sharp and Doc, uh commander Sulu from Star Trek selling these things but i assume they didn't do very well because they don't sell them anymore so yeah i thought it was funny all these commercials that say look how great our tv is and i'm like well if i don't have your tv there's no way for me to see what you're trying to show me so yeah there's that so in terms of visualization uh take a look at these two color scales on the left so the top is just an intensity scale uh, the bottom is your very common RGB color scale, right? And if you look at the top one, looks very smooth. The bottom one, not so smooth. Interesting. So you actually see areas where there seems like there's almost a break in the color, like an actual discontinuity in the color. Okay, the reason for that is that the visual system is cued to luminance. And so on a luminance ramp like this, you're monotonically increasing brightness from bright to dark, monotonically decreasing brightness. Here, if you actually looked at the brightness, it's going up and down, up and down, up and down. Okay. And so it's those changes in brightness that are causing these perceived breaks in the color space. Uh, you can see it even more so here, like here and here. I'm, I'm close, so it's harder for me to tell, but I can see that. So why do we care about that? Well, so suppose I was actually using this to try to measure uh, temperature. And suppose I looked at two temperatures right here. 
they look pretty similar, right, in terms of their color representation. But if I looked at two temperatures right here, same difference in temperature, but the difference in color you perceive is much larger, right? So in essence, you're lying to people with this, or you're misrepresenting what you're showing. Because depending on where I look, I may see a small color difference, or I may see a large color difference for the same variation in temperature. And we don't want that. But you might argue, well, that doesn't make any sense. We always show temperature maps with color. And we always use this stupid rainbow color scale. Somebody's, you want me to clean that off? Yeah. Okay. Yes, we always show temperature with color, with discrete color, never continuous. Okay, so here, if you pick discrete blocks of color, if you see a difference in color, you know it's a real difference and not a perceptual artifact, all right? The drawback here, of course, is that within a block, you can't see any variation, which is why they overlaid numbers on here to try to tell you a little bit about what the colors are representing in terms of temperature. And if you're curious about this, just go to any online, any decent online uh, weather site and look at the temperature maps or any of the maps that use color. They'll always use banded color, usually in five or 10 degree bands. Okay. So I'm sad to say that that's called the rainbow color scale because that's what you see when you see a rainbow. And the reason you see that, you notice that exactly corresponds to the colors in the visible color spectrum that we see. So for a rainbow, it's because there's water droplets in the air and as the sunlight comes in, when it hits those water droplets, it bends the light and the amount of bending you get depends on what the frequency, the wavelength is of that light. And so it basically spreads out the light just like it would if it went through a prism. And so you see a rainbow. So it's great, it's very beautiful, but it's terrible for representing information. Never use that so for continuous values. Well, what should we use for continuous values if not RGB? Uh, it's not the rainbow color scale. Well, here's that black body scale again. This is a very good scale to use if you want to show continuous color differences. And so what the black body radiation scale is, is it's a basic representation of what color you would see if you took a black body and heated it up to a certain temperature. Okay. And they actually try to show you some examples. So if you had embers or a candle or incandescent or tungsten, all right, tungsten halogen. And this is the uh, temperature point, 3,200 Kelvin. And so um, something that you'd be able to recognize that you see every day. So some cars have halogen headlights, some cars have LED lights. The LED lights are white. That's because they run at about 6,000 K. And the tungsten ones are running at about 3,200. Uh, the other thing you'll probably see occasionally is that you might be curious, what happens when we hit white and keep going? What color do you think we get down, down, down here? Old man can't bend over. It's blue, actually. You ever been driving around and you see someone with headlights that look like they're sort of bluish white? Yeah, they went to AutoZone and they bought really cheap LED bulbs and stuck them in their car, but they're too hot. They're past 6,000 and that's why they're coming out blue. Yeah. And this is a glass disc that they've heated up and they're letting it cool and they're showing some slices through it and they're using the black body radiation scale to show how hot the uh, element is. And so not surprisingly, it's cooling down faster uh, in the center than it is on the outside. It didn't get as hot on the inside. This is another really good color scale. This is what's called a uh, double-ended saturation scale. So what's actually changing here is only the saturation. Okay, so you're not getting any funny, weird bounces around in luminance, so you're not seeing any variation. And as soon as you look over here, you realize, oh, I get it. Everything above sea level is yellow and everything below sea level is blue. So this is a map of the world. Hmm, interesting. And you see things that you would expect uh, dark, tall, so Himalayas, or sorry, the, um, the Himalayas, the Andes, the Rockies. If you're curious about like, what do I see on here that's interesting? If you didn't know this, hmm. yeah, all of Antarctica's mountains. 
very tall. Okay. And the zero point is normally meant to be a semantically important point. Okay, so for an elevation map, sea level is semantically important. But if I was showing you data about, say, the heights of different people, I'm, I might pick the median height to be the zero point. So everyone who's blue is below the median. Everyone who's yellow is above the median. Doesn't have to be zero. Just has to be something that's important. Okay. How do you pick colors if you're not somebody who does this for a living? Well, you just go to a website. And so uh, the one I always recommend to people if you want a set of discrete colors is this website. It's called Color Brewer 2, brewer2.org. On here, you can actually say how many colors you want. You can say whether they're sequential, so there's a, a sort of pattern that's going up or down in value, whether they're diverging, diverging, or whether they're qualitative, like they have no order to them. Uh, like city names or something like that. And then what it'll do is it'll actually show you a whole bunch of uh, possibilities that are all known to be good. And if you click on one over on this map, it'll show you an example of the regions pretty much fully covered with a few outliers and then some examples of what if they're all mixed up together. And once you find one you like, uh, it'll tell you the exact values either in CMY, RGB, hex, or I think HLS is the other one it does. And you can ask for things like colorblind safe or printer friendly photocopy, photocopy uh, safe. If you do that though, you're gonna really restrict how many, first of all, how many classes of color you can pick and how many choices you're gonna get uh, because that really constrains your options. Yeah. If you need something more sophisticated, you can try maybe something like this. This is the color, to, color tool from NASA Ames. And so it's actually a program you have to download and run on your computer. It's not a website, but it does have a much more flexible and expressive set of colors that it can provide to you. Yeah. It's interesting. So people will go here, but they won't do this. And I'll ask them, why not? And they're like, this is dangerous. This is safe. And I'm like, mm-hmm. You just keep thinking that. Okay, so uh, if you've taken first year psychology, you'll have seen these before, but if you haven't, maybe they're fun, I don't know. Um, these don't work as well on these projectors, but if you had a book and I showed you these two examples, what you tend to see is this looks a little pinkish and this one looks a little minty. And that's because the surrounding color is influencing your perception of the gray that really exists inside here. This is a better example for this room. So you see four inset squares, all of different uh, luminances, dark on the left, light on the right. Yeah, yeah but uh, actually all the same gray. Okay. They really are. Like this is not a lie. You can take this into Photoshop and you can eye drop each of the four colors and you'll get exactly the same gray. The reason they look bright or dark is because the surround is bright or dark, right? So if something's surrounded by something brighter, it looks darker or vice versa. Sorry. Um, let's take a look at this one next. So you see a bunch of colored squares over there. And so suppose I wanted that white square to be a light turquoise, like a light blue. So I could take some of that colored overhead that we used to get film and just cut something that was exactly the size of that white square and stick it on top of there and turn it light blue, right? But anyone who knows me knows I'm lazy. And so I'm not gonna cut anything. I'm just gonna take the whole sheet and put it over all the squares, right? You should get the same result. Hmm. Somehow that white square looks whiter. And if we just keep looking at it, it won't take very long before it looks exactly like it did before I put anything on there. So this is color constancy. What your visual system is doing is it's saying, I think what you wanna see is the color of these squares. And I see that you've stuck a blue filter on top of there. Let me just take that out for you, okay? And if you ski, snowboard, do things like that, and you put on snow glasses, snow goggles, 
you see the same phenomena. They're usually orange or green, something like this. So you throw on a set of orange snow goggles, everything looks orange for about 30 seconds. And then everything looks normal again. And when you take them off, everything looks bright for about 30 seconds and it looks normal again. So now it's gone. Okay. Uh, you can look at the same kind of example up here. Um, two orange dots. And then you want to look here at the brown square on the top and the orange one in the center, or there are sort of offset hearts here. Um, I guess you'd say red and purple, maybe. And of course, that's harder to see here, but that's a constant color line connecting the two. And so they really are the same orange. This I find even more interesting, which is that the brown and the orange are the same orange. And here you can see that they're all the same color for the hearts. But even when I cut away part and leave part there, the part that I didn't cut away, it still looks purple and red. And it's because of the surrounding colors that I'm using, the yellows and the blues. This is the most important slide, right? Because it means you can fool people, like you can make money off of this. So here's some examples of grayscale versus double-ended saturation scale. And you can decide where you think you're getting an advantage. So on the sinusoidal grading, I think the grayscale is a little bit better. You get a little bit more definition up here in the upper right than you do over there. Um, but for the torus, I'd say it's either a wash or maybe I'd give the wind to the big orange scale. And certainly for the um, reconstructed skull, I think you can see a lot more detail on the blue orange scale versus the luminance scale. One of the interesting things about luminance is that um, perceived difference in luminance is not linear. It's uh, based on power lots, exponential. What that means is that if I go from say 20% to 22%, brightness, that difference is the same as 50% to 55% brightness. Okay, so what happens is you pretty quickly run out of brightness as you walk up, right? The other problem with brightness is that things near the bottom and things near the top just look the same, even though they're not, okay? And then on the right are two maps of Canada. Uh, the top one, the one on the left is a soil litter map. So it's basically showing you the different types of soil uh, that exist predominantly. Um, and the reason I like this map is because it was actually built by a set of high school students, Kwantlen High School. And so Laura would know this. Uh, if you show me a crappy visualization and you're one of my students, I show you this. And I tell you, high school students just kicked your ass. <laughs> Try harder, all right? Good map. This is from the, it would be the equivalent of the USGS. Um, it's Canada's version of forestry services. And so what I like about this is it doesn't just show you where the predominant sort of type of tree is. The actual legend isn't just a set of colors, but it's also pictures of the trees and their relative heights, sizes. So if you know nothing at all about like what a fir tree looks like versus a hemlock versus a pine, Maybe you can look at this and get an idea of what they actually look like. So when you walk out in the forest, you might be able to recognize what they are. Okay, so just to sum up, we've looked at color for things like aesthetic. And so on the left is a Jackson Pollock, a famous American author. Uh, you've, he's a contemporary author, uh, artist, sorry. So you've probably seen pictures of him. He's even on film where he's like, He's this guy, right? Yeah. And I always tell people, or people tell me like, I can do that. And I'm like, nope, no, you can't. <laughs> um, we can all do this, but it's the actual composition and the variation of color and the layout and all those other things that make this what it is. So maybe you can do this, but it's not as easy as just dipping your brush into a can of paint and doing this, okay? The other thing I loved about Pollock is if you ever see uh, any pictures of him, whenever he's doing this, he's always smoking. And so he can't do anything because his hands are busy. 
So the cigarette just keeps burning down. And I'm like, how are you not getting any ash on your, on your painting? Um, the other interesting fact, well, I don't know if it's interesting. So Pollock died young in a car crash in a convertible, I think, with two women, neither of whom was his wife. So, yeah. We don't know anything about that. This is Pablo Picasso, Cubism. If you want a very, very basic um, idea of how some Cubism works, think about looking at a person from multiple different perspectives and then combining them together. That's in some sense what Cubism is doing. Uh, I often ask my students, so do you think this would be one of Picasso's earlier styles or one of his later styles? And of course, my intuition would be later that you work up to this. Uh, this was the second style he ever produced. So one of his very first styles. All right, so portrait of a genius as a young man, yes. Uh, and then you might wonder, so what happened? Like, did he do nothing after that? Ah, no, uh, this is just his most famous work, but the other work is also equally uh, impressive. And if you're curious, uh, you can go out and take a look at some of Picasso's pencil sketches are some of the things he did later in life and they're absolutely fascinating and beautiful um, he did a commercial i think for apple and so he was standing behind a clear plexiglass screen so he's actually painting backwards because he's painting out to the camera and so he takes his paintbrush and he goes no no no, no. it's about a 10 second single stroke and he gets about halfway through and right away you're like oh that's a bull and then i thought to myself why do we all think that's a bull like nobody disagrees. And I realized Picasso had somehow looked at a bull and he'd figured out what the exact specific things were about a bull that made everybody recognize it for what it was. And he encoded those in that stroke. That was the genius of the stroke. It wasn't painting it, but what was in there when he painted it. This is uh, Van Gogh, of course. Um, don't know if this is his last painting, but there were a series of, I think it was four paintings, wheat fields and crows. And these were the last set of paintings he painted before he committed suicide. Um, he's considered an impressionist, maybe a post-impressionist if you wanna get very particular about it. Um, but you can see, as opposed to say Picasso, very different style. So very obvious brush strokes, all right. Uh, very highly saturated colors, he used uh, palette knife and other things. And so, I tell people, well, I tell people two things. Uh, first, be careful because you probably shouldn't do this. But second, if you're at an actual exhibition where there is a Van Gogh and you can get away with it, um, there often be pictures of uh, cottages and little rural villages and that. And so you have these thatch roofs and a little shadow underneath them. Get up to the painting and look at it side on like this. You'll be able to see the depth of paint. And one of the things you'll probably see is that the shadow, it's not a real, it's a real shadow, it's not painted. And it was because Picasso knew the painting would be lit from above. And so the roof on the cottage was the last thing he added. Okay. Yeah. The other thing for any painting, like um, you go to one of these exhibitions, they funnel you through the gift shop at the end. And they always have one of these coffee table books with all the paintings you just saw that they want to sell you. Open the book up and then look out the door. You'll be able to see one of the paintings, find it in the book and take a look at the two. Absolutely different. And that's a very expensive book that they spent a lot of time using. There's no way to reproduce the vibrancy and the beauty of a painting like this. This doesn't look anything like the real painting, okay? If you like this kind of thing, go and see the real thing. Go to the North Carolina Museum of Art. It's one of the best art museums in the country, okay? They have a standing exhibition that has things like Monet and um, um, Wyatt, okay? And they get some exhibitions. I don't know how they do it, but I went to see an exhibition of Monet and it went to New York, Los Angeles, and Raleigh, okay? It's an amazing museum. These are some examples of uh, other visualizations. This is the increase in the size of the ozone hole over the South Pole uh, from 1979 to 2011. Although I was told the last time I showed this that the hole is now getting smaller. 
So that's good news. Um, this is the Northwest Passage above Canada. And so it was always uh, not traversable during the winter. And many British expedition explorers who are very famous all tried to get through here. They all, they all died. Um, but now you can traverse it. In fact, it has been traversed in the summer. And so interestingly, because it's traversable now, there's a huge fight. It always used to be part of Canada, but now that you can get in there and there's a lot of natural resources that people want, uh, Russia, Canada, Denmark, and the United States are all claiming it as their own. Yeah. So thanks for that. Uh, this is an ozone map, uh, not ozone, uh, um, pollution map. And so you might wonder, oh, that's interesting. Like, why do you have such a large color scale if you're only using a few of the colors? It's because I'm only showing part of the world. If you look at other parts, you'll see these colors showing up. Okay. And then this is actually a Hubble picture. I'll have to replace this with a James Webb picture, but this is a Hubble picture of the Pleiades system. And these are called the Seven Sisters. And so you remember I told you that telescopes can see outside of the visible color spectrum. So what's happened is that the Hubble's information has actually been squeezed down or what, what is called tone mapped to produce an image that is in the visible color spectrum so we can see it. So it's very beautiful, but this is not something you would ever be able to see in real life because it's a post-processed result of what the Hubble saw. So of course, nothing happens in isolation. Um, so these are some of the people I worked with. Rob St. Amant, colleague, he's actually left the university. He's now working at ARO. Uh, he was at uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland, but I think he's been promoted and he should be back in the area. Uh, this is Jim Enns. So I have a sort of psychology computer science PhD and Jim was my psychology supervisor. And so, um, Russ Taylor. Russ used to work at UNC Chapel Hill on visualization. And interestingly, he started working for the department as he was finishing his PhD there. And so at age 45, he had his 20, he retired. <laughs> yeah. And he retired because his passion is to share his skill set in computers uh, with people who need it. And so his real job is that he goes out into disaster areas where NGOs are working and he helps them set up the computer systems for communication so that they can actually communicate very quickly with one another and coordinate. So they're not bringing in the same things or they all understand who needs what where and they can organize that. And then his not day job is he consults to keep body and soul together uh, so he can go out and do the other stuff. And then this is Pierre Poulain. Pierre was a graduate student when I was a graduate student. Uh, he's now, I think he just finished, but he was the chair of DITO, which is the uh, computer science department at the University of Montreal, University de Montréal, which is the number one French-speaking university in Canada. Um, very good friend of mine, but funny guy. So first, he hates having pictures taken of him. I don't know how I got this. Um, I took a picture of him, and he was going to beat me until I give it back to him. Uh, the other thing that is interesting is he doesn't want you to know when his birthday is. And so I worked on this for a while and I told him, okay, I, I've got it. This is your birthday. And he's like, nope. And I said, well, I said, I'm, I'm out. I said, what I do know though, is that one day during the year, that's your birthday. And so I've decided this is your birthday. And he told me, but it's not my birthday. And I said, unless you're willing to tell me that's your birthday. And so every year on that day, I wish him a happy birthday. It just infuriates him. So. So, sick parvus magna, yep, great things from small beginnings. And for all the students here, right? This is where you'll end up from where you started. So thank you. Any questions you have, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thank you. I think, um... We're at time, so if you have another engagement, please feel free to leave. But we do have time if Dr. Healy's willing to answer a few questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll bring you the microphone so everyone on Zoom can hear it. 
Everyone used to ask me about the drafts. A quick, a quick question is, uh, do the different paint companies use the same name for the same color? They do not, okay. interestingly. So it's even more varied than just Bear's colors or Glidden's colors, yeah. Maybe they're using the same people though for the names, I don't know. Any other questions? I have one up here. Thank you. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the colors represented in different languages and different cultures. You said English is one of the only languages that depicted all of those colors. In yeah, so in, I don't know if it's one of the only, I just know that it's one of the, uh, one of the languages that uses all 11 base colors. And so there was no, there was no indication of like any evidence of why the number of base colors that linguistic culture uses is what it is. But this is all part of a psychological um, question that they ask, which is that if you have more names for things, does that mean you have a better ability to distinguish between variations of that thing? Or does it just mean you have more names for that thing? So um, I don't know if I should tell you this, but the sort of uh, one of the founders in this had a book called Women, Fire, and Other Dangerous Things. And this is this whole book about this particular issue. And so a good example is in uh, if you talk to the Inuit, they have about eight or nine different names for white. And so the question is, does that mean that they're better at seeing differences in white? Or do they just have that many names because they need them to describe different variations of white because of the environment they live in? And that's still an open question, actually. Yeah. And do they know anything about why certain colors came in in that order? Like red was always the first on that list and then... Black and white, it makes sense to me, but the other ones, no. I haven't actually seen any particular argument about why they came in in the order that they did. Yeah. Just that there's consistency, it seems, in what people use. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Thank you. Freaky. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Oh, this is one of my students. <laughs> Remember, I'm paying your salary. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, uh, how do you think uh, glasses like Enchroma uh, reproduce color for the colorblind people? So I don't know for sure because I haven't looked at them, but this was a whole area in computer graphics for a while, which was called uh, colorblind recoloring. And so what they would do is they would take a photograph or an image, and then they would recolor it in a way that they knew colorblind people would be able to distinguish all the different colors, and they would try to keep it as close as possible to the original. So it wouldn't look like the original, but it would look close. But anything that colorblind people had distinguishing differences in color in, in the original would be clearly distinguishable in the uh, recolored version. And so my guess would be that's how these glasses are working. Uh, you would have to be colorblind, first of all. Yeah, well, I'll put them on and see what you see. Yeah, but I do not know what your rate is, so I cannot verify if what I see with the glasses is actually what I'm using. That's correct. Yep, there's no way to know that. But you could certainly see if they worked or not. Like that test I told you in the driver's school, it's all over the place. And so you can just go online and drop the glasses on and see if it. you can now see the actual uh, number. The other thing you can do is you can do something like... Um, there's a test for colorblindness where you have to line up a whole bunch of colors uh, in order. And if you're nor what they call normally sighted, it's very easy to do. But if you're colorblind, it's impossible because they are particularly the Ishihara test. It's particularly selected, so it's hard. And the thing I find really funny about this is we used to use this during uh, open house. And so these guys would come in with their girlfriends or their wives. And I'd be like, are you colorblind? And they must know, right? And they're like, I'm not colorblind. And I'm like, oh, great, we'll line these up. And they'd start lining them up. And of course, their uh, significant other eh, would start laughing because it's clearly wrong and women aren't colorblind. And then they would think, if I just try harder, I can do it. And I'm like, no, it's not going to make any difference. And it's nothing to be embarrassed about either. Like, but yeah, so that happened. Very good. Um, I was just curious, like, what are some things you see in visualization and like research papers you read or presentations 
where you're like, oh man, I wish you had just done this change. It would have made like the color scheme a lot better or visualization a lot easier to understand. Actually, Russ and one of his students wrote a whole paper called um, Why the Rainbow Color Scale Should Never Be Used. And they actually counted the number of times it had been used in that particular conference over the prior five years. And it was like massive number, right? And everybody agreed what he said was true, but they just kept using it. Yeah, so it had no effect on their use. Um, so that would be one example. Um, apart from context, I don't see any reason why you would use the rainbow color scale. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, so I'll, do you know Tableau? Mm -hmm. Tableau is one of the premier sort of um, commercially available visualization systems. And I actually know people that work there. So until very recently, you want to know what their default color scale used? Yeah, red and green, right? I mean, the worst possible two colors you could pick. So I'd get a new version. It would be red and green. I'd phone my friend at Tableau and I'd be like, what is wrong with you? What is, you know better, what is wrong with you? And he'd be like, I'm trying, I'm trying. And I'm like, you're not trying hard enough. But now it's actually orange and blue. So they fixed it. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Healy. You're welcome. Um, please join me and give me, him another round of applause. And thank you all. Have a good afternoon.